For a long time now it's been a widely accepted and rarely questioned belief that a strong corporate culture goes hand in hand with success. However, a recent study has caused some doubt of this principle. Although some of the court argue the culture a company builds up may be strong, but wrong, there is a point in every employee market to the same tune, if they are all marching in the wrong direction. For a long time now it's been a widely accepted and rarely questioned belief that a strong corporate culture goes hand in hand with success. However, a recent study has caused some doubt of this principle. Although some of the court argue the culture a company builds up may be strong, but wrong, there is a point in every employee market to the same tune, if they are all marching in the wrong direction. Emerald is defined by its green color. To be an emerald, a specimen must have a distinctly green color that falls in the range from bluish green to slightly yellowish green. To be an emerald, the specimen must also have a rich color. Stones with weak saturation or light tone should be called green barrel. If the barrel's color is greenish blue, then it is an aquamarine. If it is greenish yellow, it is heliodor. This color definition is a source of confusion. Which you, tone, and saturation combinations are the dividing lines between green barrel and emerald. Professionals in the gem and jewelry trade can disagree on where the lines should be drawn. Some believe that the name emerald should be used when chromium is the cause of the green color. And that stones colored by vanadium should be called green barrel. Calling a gem an emerald instead of a green barrel can have a significant impact upon its price and marketability. This color confusion exists within the United States. In some other countries, any barrel with a green color no matter how faint is called an emerald. Emerald is defined by its green color. To be an emerald, a specimen must have a distinctly green color that falls in the range from bluish green to slightly yellowish green. To be an emerald, the specimen must also have a rich color. Stones with weak saturation or light tone should be called green barrel. If the barrel's color is greenish blue, then it is an aquamarine. If it is greenish yellow, it is heliodor. This color definition is a source of confusion. Which you, tone, and saturation combinations are the dividing lines between green barrel and emerald. Professionals in the gem and jewelry trade can disagree on where the lines should be drawn. Some believe that the name emerald should be used when chromium is the cause of the green color. And that stones colored by vanadium should be called green barrel. Calling a gem an emerald instead of a green barrel can have a significant impact upon its price and marketability. This color confusion exists within the United States. In some other countries, any barrel with a green color no matter how faint is called an emerald. The Mississippi River built this area, each year it would flood. It would bring in a lot of nutrients and a lot of sediment, and the sediment would settle over the marsh, and over time that sediment gets compacted. Imagine if you dig a hole in your yard and you put, and you have the pile of dirt next to it, and a week later that pile is going to be smaller because the dirt compacts. Well the same thing when the delta was built by the Mississippi, the delta itself compacts over time, and under a natural hydrology the river would bring sediments back out to those areas and deposit sediments on top of areas that are subsiding. And so we actually build land with an active delta.
The Mississippi River built this area, each year it would flood, it would bring in a lot of nutrients and a lot of sediment, and the sediment would settle over the marsh, and over time that sediment gets compacted. Imagine if you dig a hole in your yard and you put, and you have the pile of dirt next to it, and a week later that pile is going to be smaller because the dirt compacts. Well the same thing when the delta was built by the Mississippi, the delta itself compacts over time and under a natural hydrology the river would bring sediments back out to those areas and deposit sediments on top of areas that are subsiding. And so we actually build land with an active delta. There's little doubt that genetically modified crops have the potential to offer great benefits to the world, yet they continue to be opposed by many people, even though any risks attached to their use have not been clearly established. The reasons seem to be a deep distrust of the motives of large agricultural companies, along with a generalized feeling that it's always dangerous to, as some would put it, play around with nature. There's little doubt that genetically modified crops have the potential to offer great benefits to the world, yet they continue to be opposed by many people, even though any risks attached to their use have not been clearly established. The reasons seem to be a deep distrust of the motives of large agricultural companies, along with a generalized feeling that it's always dangerous to, as some would put it, play around with nature. Two years ago, an earthquake off the coast of Sumatra triggered a tsunami that killed nearly a quarter of a million people. Scientists say Asia is at risk for at least two more massive quakes. One could strike near the source of the 2004 tsunami, the other directly under Tokyo. Two years ago, an earthquake off the coast of Sumatra triggered a tsunami that killed nearly a quarter of a million people. Scientists say Asia is at risk for at least two more massive quakes. One could strike near the source of the 2004 tsunami, the other directly under Tokyo. My current research at the moment is really quite broad. I work at the interface between the arts and humanities, particularly archaeology, but trying to find questions which are very difficult to answer. Unless you start integrating computing and visualizations. So really I work in this boundary between trying to understand cultural questions about the past, but those sorts of questions that you can't address, unless you start reconstructing. Start modeling and visualizing past landscapes, objects and movement of people. My current research at the moment is really quite broad. I work at the interface between the arts and humanities, particularly archaeology, but trying to find questions which are very difficult to answer. Unless you start integrating computing and visualizations. So really I work in this boundary between trying to understand cultural questions about the past, but those sorts of questions that you can't address, unless you start reconstructing. 
Start modeling and visualizing past landscapes, objects and movement of people. I think it's often underestimated the connection between doing research, live research, and teaching undergraduates and the undergraduate programs. Because, of course if you're working at CERN on a frontier experiment you come back to give a lecture, you're buzzing with activity of what's going on your new results. It just makes the whole lecture much more interesting for students. It's always really exciting to look ahead at new science and what might happen in the future. I must say, lots depends on what we find in the next few years at the start of the Large Hadron Collider. We are expecting to find very many new phenomena. So the thing we'll want to be building in 10 years time will depend on what we find. I think it's often underestimated the connection between doing research, live research, and teaching undergraduates and the undergraduate programs. Because, of course if you're working at CERN on a frontier experiment you come back to give a lecture, you're buzzing with activity of what's going on your new results. It just makes the whole lecture much more interesting for students. It's always really exciting to look ahead at new science and what might happen in the future. I must say, lots depends on what we find in the next few years at the start of the Large Hadron Collider. We are expecting to find very many new phenomena. So the thing we'll want to be building in 10 years time will depend on what we find. I'm a big fan of gap years. I took one myself, so I'm probably biased. I think that if you've got something you want to do in the year before you come to university, that you should do it. And a lot of students who want to study a biology degree actually want to go off and travel and perhaps work on a conservation project. And of course, that's all very good. It will contribute towards your degree and your preparation for that. And then when you come to us, you'll be ready for your studies. So if there's something you really want to do, then my advice is to go for it. I'm a big fan of gap years. I took one myself, so I'm probably biased. I think that if you've got something you want to do in the year before you come to university, that you should do it. And a lot of students who want to study a biology degree actually want to go off and travel and perhaps work on a conservation project. And of course, that's all very good. It will contribute towards your degree and your preparation for that. And then when you come to us, you'll be ready for your studies. So if there's something you really want to do, then my advice is to go for it. This is one thing we can say about babies. Human babies compared to babies of other species is that we are entirely dependent on our carers to bring us up and for us to survive. And so it's very important for babies to get into relationships with somebody who's going to look after them well. So, biology has meant that babies and the adults are geared up to be in relationship with each other from the start.
This is one thing we can say about babies. Human babies compared to babies of other species is that we are entirely dependent on our carers to bring us up and for us to survive. And so it's very important for babies to get into relationships with somebody who's going to look after them well. So, biology has meant that babies and the adults are geared up to be in relationship with each other from the start. Numbers and diagrams are highly abstract and condensed summaries of the world. They require a degree of mental effort to bridge the gap between them and the aspects of the real world they stand for. Approach them slowly and with care, allowing yourself time to get the feel of what you are looking at. Don't assume you already know what you are looking at. It's easy to be distracted by the surface appearance of a diagram. But we are really interested in the underlying message. Numbers and diagrams are highly abstract and condensed summaries of the world. They require a degree of mental effort to bridge the gap between them and the aspects of the real world they stand for. Approach them slowly and with care, allowing yourself time to get the feel of what you are looking at. Don't assume you already know what you are looking at. It's easy to be distracted by the surface appearance of a diagram. But we are really interested in the underlying message. My name is Posey D and I now work in sports marketing and branding events and team management. We work with big brands, I work with a shoe company. And we work with a team of young people across Europe, who are all professional surfers, snowboarders, boxers. And we send them on trips, we organize adverts, we organize magazine shoots, and try and create an image around the shoe brand. I've come from quite an unconventional background. I was a professional snowboarder myself for three or four years, full time, so I'm not used to sitting in an office, I'm not used to going to work every day. And still I've only been doing this job for a year, and sometimes I'm like oh god, have to go to work, again, that's ridiculous. But it's always different, so it's fine. And some weeks it's quite quiet, other weeks it's totally full on and really challenging. My name is Posey D and I now work in sports marketing and branding events and team management. We work with big brands, I work with a shoe company, and we work with a team of young people across Europe, who are all professional surfers, snowboarders, boxers. And we send them on trips, we organize adverts, we organize magazine shoots, and try and create an image around the shoe brand. I've come from quite an unconventional background. I was a professional snowboarder myself for three or four years, full time, so I'm not used to sitting in an office, I'm not used to going to work every day. And still I've only been doing this job for a year, and sometimes I'm like oh god, have to go to work, again, that's ridiculous. But it's always different, so it's fine. And some weeks it's quite quiet, other weeks it's totally full on and really challenging.
For many years, the favorite horror story about abrupt climate change was that a shift in ocean currents could radically cool Europe's climate. These currents, called the overturning circulation, bring warm water and warm temperatures north from the equator to Europe. Susan Lucia, an oceanographer at Duke University, says scientists have long worried that this ocean circulation could be disrupted. For many years, the favorite horror story about abrupt climate change was that a shift in ocean currents could radically cool Europe's climate. These currents, called the overturning circulation, bring warm water and warm temperatures north from the equator to Europe. Susan Lucia, an oceanographer at Duke University, says scientists have long worried that this ocean circulation could be disrupted. I think it's really important for young people not to feel restricted in their choices and also to be aware of the choices that are available to them and obviously the media has an incredibly important role to play in that in letting people know the great range of science that is out there and is potentially a career. I think we tend to talk about science as this big kind of monolith but of course actually it's this beautiful multifaceted thing, you know, there's almost something for everybody there. There are so many different aspects of it that really attract lots of different types of personality I think and, you know, somebody that's going to be attracted to working in biology might be a very different person from somebody who's attracted to engineering. I suppose it's about knowing the breadth of opportunities that are out there and so anything that universities and broadcast media can do to make sure that those opportunities are visible I think is really important. I think it's really important for young people not to feel restricted in their choices and also to be aware of the choices that are available to them and obviously the media has an incredibly important role to play in that in letting people know the great range of science that is out there and is potentially a career. I think we tend to talk about science as this big kind of monolith but of course actually it's this beautiful multifaceted thing, you know, there's almost something for everybody there. There are so many different aspects of it that really attract lots of different types of personality I think and, you know, somebody that's going to be attracted to working in biology might be a very different person from somebody who's attracted to engineering. I suppose it's about knowing the breadth of opportunities that are out there and so anything that universities and broadcast media can do to make sure that those opportunities are visible I think is really important. Well, Alex, the National Association of Realtors is at least putting the champagne on ice. The industry group says the slight rise in sales for previously owned homes shows the housing market is finally stabilizing, which is the first sign of a recovery. Now, that of course is an interpretation of the numbers, Alex, and one that's coming from an organization known for being somewhat of a cheerleader for the housing market. Since its members are made up of realtors who've been losing a lot of money in the slump. Now. For a more sober view, I talked to Wellesley housing economist Carl Case, and he says the slight uptick in sales hardly offsets the fact that numbers are down 20% from the year before. Well, Alex, 
the National Association of Realtors is at least putting the champagne on ice. The industry group says the slight rise in sales for previously owned homes shows the housing market is finally stabilizing, which is the first sign of a recovery. Now, that of course is an interpretation of the numbers, Alex, and one that's coming from an organization known for being somewhat of a cheerleader for the housing market, since its members are made up of realtors who've been losing a lot of money in the slump. Now, for a more sober view, I talked to Wellesley housing economist Carl Case. And he says the slight uptick in sales hardly offsets the fact that numbers are down 20% from the year before. The question that most people want to ask at this point is, how do we speed up the transition? If it's a good idea to have fewer people in the world, which may or may not be the case, then how might we move towards a situation in which population growth rates are reduced? How might we speed up the transition, the demographic transition that I've talked about? And I think there are probably four kinds of answers. I'm not going to suggest that all the kinds of answers, but those are the most obvious ones. The question that most people want to ask at this point is, how do we speed up the transition? If it's a good idea to have fewer people in the world, which may or may not be the case, then how might we move towards a situation in which population growth rates are reduced? How might we speed up the transition, the demographic transition that I've talked about? And I think there are probably four kinds of answers. I'm not going to suggest that all the kinds of answers, but those are the most obvious ones. Fungi are an important part of any forest or woodland ecosystem. They are the major agents by which twigs and leaves are broken down, releasing nutrients for reabsorption by plants. And we know fungi also form a constructive partnership with living trees. David Robinson from the Open University's Live Sciences Department explains that although we have known about this partnership and relationship for some time, we are now learning more about the nature of that relationship. Fungi are an important part of any forest or woodland ecosystem. They are the major agents by which twigs and leaves are broken down, releasing nutrients for reabsorption by plants. And we know fungi also form a constructive partnership with living trees. David Robinson from the Open University's Live Sciences Department explains that although we have known about this partnership and relationship for some time, we are now learning more about the nature of that relationship. Thanks to blood's ability to clot even the surface of a nasty gas just able to heal up. But platelet cells aren't sticky all the time. And now researchers have identified the key protein that makes them come together. This video shows how normal cells spread out tiny arms to catch other cells and to grasp onto the surface of a wound. When the crucial protein is absent, the cells don't stick out their arms as much and can grip the surface of an injury as tightly.
thanks to blood's ability to clot even the surface of a nasty gas just able to heal up. But platelet cells aren't sticky all the time. And now researchers have identified the key protein that makes them come together. This video shows how normal cells spread out tiny arms to catch other cells and to grasp onto the surface of a wound. When the crucial protein is absent, the cells don't stick out their arms as much and can grip the surface of an injury as tightly. For four centuries after the Viking declined, the people of the Shetland Islands off the north coast of Scotland continued to sell their goods through the North European Hanseatic League. The Hansau merchant bought shiploads of salted fish and in return the islanders got cash, grain, cloth and other goods. This lasted until the Act of Union between Scotland and England in 1707. This act prohibited the Hansau merchant from trading with Scotland. Consequently Shetland went into an economic depression. The independent farmers of Shetland had to sell their land and were then obligated to pay rent, eventually becoming serfs. For four centuries after the Viking declined, the people of the Shetland Islands off the north coast of Scotland continued to sell their goods through the North European Hanseatic League. The Hansau merchant bought shiploads of salted fish and in return the islanders got cash, grain, cloth and other goods. This lasted until the Act of Union between Scotland and England in 1707. This act prohibited the Hansau merchant from trading with Scotland. Consequently Shetland went into an economic depression. The independent farmers of Shetland had to sell their land and were then obligated to pay rent, eventually becoming serfs. 